it's um, it's nice when girls um, come and say hello to you. That's nice. Or um, you know, if somebody who um, normally wouldn't say hello you meet, and uh, there's an open conversation and you can share something intimate with them, um, kind of straight away. Some people have confided in me different things, and um, some people I can uh, say things to um, to make them laugh it, because that situation is loaded that way. So from that point of view, I, I, I really like it. Um, I think the um, I think wanting to be um, well known um, is one thing. And wanting to be a sting distinguished climber was a, another thing, but they tend to get um, mixed up. Uh, I think climbing I've never really conceived of as a sport particularly. I mean, it's hideously competitive because you do something, potentially particularly the line of, of the climbing that I do, you can do something which if somebody wants to repeat it can kill them potentially. So it's about as competitive as it gets. It's like TT racing or... Um, you know, very extreme paragliding or, or going down the Dunkosi in a... I mean, there's a lot of ways to kill yourself with extreme sports, but the fact that people don't is, is you know, is, is quite amazing, really. And I think that's because they um, have very strong awareness and, um, you know, pay attention to what's going on. I mean, climbing, it, climbing feels like an art to me. Like, when you do... Um, I love drawing as well. I've always liked drawing, although I don't use colour very much which is something that I want to try and introduce to the drawings and things that I do. But um, you get an inkling that you can do something, and following that inkling is, is the most interesting thing for me. Um, you, you know, I'm walking along a, a crag, and I get to know the crags really intimately, because uh, I used to go there on all the different weathers, because it wasn't particularly a, um, an indoor training sport then. It, even some of the training facilities were outside, so... Um, I used to walk along a lot of the edges in Derbyshire and, um, and imagine climbing the routes. So if, if I climbed uh, 500 routes during the year, my, my mind climbed 20,000 routes during that year, um, or 20,000 ascents. You know, Some of those ascents would be 300 efforts at one line. I think if you um, end up killing yourself, um, and you leave a lot of unhappy people behind, it's not worth it. If you manage to avoid that scenario and you experience climbing fantastic routes all around the world and you climb beautiful things with ways of moving that you've unraveled out of your imagination and you've shared your enthusiasm with lots of people who then might take up the sport a lot less risky level but um, enjoy it hugely, then it seems to me that the risk of it is justified. Not, I mean, you know, I'm trying to justify it here, I suppose, because somebody's asking me a question, is it worth it? So, yeah, I think it's justified. Um, and also, you can do a lot about the risk. You can choose what you do, who with, when you do it, make sure your gear's all in decent nick. You can really get to know your intuition well so that you feel whether you're going towards your grave or whether or not you're going towards you know a ha happy place the reason why i do um walking on the cliffs is um i've i know the cliffs really well in in derbyshire there's lots of reasons one is i hurt my body at one point and so i couldn't use my one of my hands so i did one-handed climbing and then I also do no-handed climbing. And I really enjoy it because it changes the cliff as a toy. Um, you know, if you're using your legs, you can propel yourself a lot faster. So one of the climbs in Derbyshire is a climb called Sunset Slab. It's um, 4C, um, so I don't know, 4 in UIAA or something. So uh, on this route, um, it, it's, it's rough friction, but there's not many holds on it. And we top rope it and um, you can get enough speed up on it that you get air jumping over a bulge on it. And um, you have to trust your body, can see where the holds are and know where the holds are, and you discover a different part of you. 
because you, you're not thinking your way from A, B, C, D. It's going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, 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 L M, N, O, P. And, and you're, in fact, you're, you're hitting P before you hit Q sometimes and then going back to P and you're twisting and you're um, sometimes pushing into the rock to use your inward momentum that you've already got to paste grip onto the place where there isn't a hold that you need a hold. So your momentum is a source of grip, which is really strange that your speed and time um, is, is related to the geometry in a totally transcending way. So if you get good at it, you can climb unclimbable things by, by using running techniques at speed, which can be also you know, used with hands. I mean, obviously, it can't be done hugely at, on steep stuff, but there is still elements that you can use. Um, the speed of your mind clicking from one mode to another, that stays with you. I think the reason why I developed such a dynamic style of climbing was I was short, for one thing, and not particularly strong, although I became really strong, in a way, at times, with mantle shelving, and I was very strong in really tiny holds and could hold really quite surprisingly small stuff. So I had some strengths, but I was always was interested in running up things before I sort of took up climbing. I was probably into parkour before I was into rock climbing, actually. And for instance, there was a, um, a big um, playground beam um, that I used to run along, and it had metal hoops on it. And this thing was two A-frames and a big beam and this beam used to go backwards and forwards. It was like, it was like a medieval battering ram for, for a castle. And it used to go up and down a metre as, as, as it went through its motion. So if you were to be in the middle of it, you would be running backwards and forwards going, da 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 And so it was, it was accelerating and slowing down according to how much force you put into it. And I would practice that. And I would know how my body was related to what was around me, even at speed. So I got to know that that's this sort of feeling. And that sort of feeling, when I've got it, is reliable for every move. So dynamic climbing is um, a way of ironing out all of the bits of you that are left in, in between your mind and your body. So you can clean it out in a way that you can't do it with, with normal climbing. That, that actually makes you more between your mind and body, I would say, potentially. You get in your own way. Um, and if you're climbing dynamically, you don't weigh as much. If you're moving up, some of your, some of your movement is countering some of gravity. Now, usually not in the um, helpful, reliable direction, but um, if, you, if you learn how to use that for small amounts of time. So you might be going this way, but if you kick a foothold, you do this, and then you start to fall back. And that might be just what you need to go onto a side pull, which you could not use from here at all. And it might be in a position where you can't see it. So if you've been practicing dynamic stuff, where you can't look at everything, but you know where it is, not only can you hit this and use it by dynamics, you can also know where it is. So it's like, it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, a bif it's a superior method, I think, but not... not um, it's a very brilliant additional matrix to have of movement. I think a lot of people think that they're not dynamic climbers. And actually, you always move. And every time you move, your body tries to fall off the rock. And rather than always trying to get stronger to fight that force, if you are aware before every move of how you're going to fall off, you can reposition your body to exactly cancel that fall. And that's the dynamics that is most useful for the static climber and what you can build into. So if I'm, it's Alexander's technique is exactly the same thing. If, if this is the end of the move, and this is the start of the move, I can't, I can't do it. A static method means I can't move. A static's a really weird phrase, static movement. You know, it's like peacekeeping, isn't it, with a gun. Um, but uh, my, my point is that you can learn 
So you have, um, say you're hopping onto a top of a, of, a, of a tin of beans, okay? If you imagine that position when you're up on the top of the beans, and from where you are, you only imagine that shape. That's almost enough to do it perfectly. But you've also got to work out how your body is, is falling off in that, in that one. And in that you've got twisting forces, you've got to have to um, twi uh, twist and drop your body on. And you've got to sort of feel when you know that shape in your mind is the correct shape. And it's the correct shape when it's, it's still, when you are still, and then your stillness produces um, motion. It naturally, you just know it works, so it happens. And when you learn to allow that to happen, it's like turning on a movement gland in your brain that was always there. That's, 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 that's what does work. You know, I really, I, it's really an exciting part of my life that I've managed to, to do that, you know. One of the things I'm most proud of, probably. Declumsification methods. <laughs>